started. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming to Immerse Yourself. We have a great turnout today. My name is Julia and this is the History of Diving Museum. I'm sure you all know. I'll talk a little bit about some upcoming events we have. Um, so uh, for next month, we're going to have a coral restoration talk um, on the third Wednesday, just like this one. So you're welcome to RSVP for that one. Come learn about coral restoration. Details to follow. Uh, later this month on the 29th as well, we have Dive Into Art and Music, which is uh, a musical event that is a tribute to artist, diver, and musician Jerry Garcia. We're going to have prints of his artwork on sale. We're going to have Rainbow Full of Sound performing, doing musical tribute to Jerry Garcia. Uh, there's going to be food, music, dancing. It's going to be a lot of fun. So if you want to get tickets for that, you can get them here. Um, and if you have any questions and want to learn more about it, let me know. Um, for our featured exhibit that's currently open right now, we have Dive Into Art Coral Creations. Um, it's an amazing art exhibit that has things from local artists as well as schools and narrative from several different coral restoration organizations about their work here in the Keys. And that is going to be on display until April 17th. So be sure to check it out before it closes. Uh, we also have Vintage Dive Weekend coming up in May, on May 4th and 5th. So we're gonna have Divers going out in vintage gear, including double hose regulators, helmets, Mark V suits. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. More details on that are going to come. But if you would like to join and use some of that historic gear, be sure to check that event out. Um, in May, on the 17th, we have our new featured exhibit, Salvaging the Deep, which is all about deep water salvage operations, um, famous wrecks like the Titanic. Um, salvaged work like Pearl Harbor. It's gonna feature all of that. And that's gonna open May 17th. Um, for tonight, we have Dr. Chelsea Bennis. She is joining us from Florida Atlantic University. And thank you, Chelsea, for coming all the way down here to give this presentation. Uh, she's gonna tell us all about her work on octopus biology and behavior. And without further ado, I'm gonna pass things off to Chelsea and I hope you guys enjoy. Thanks for coming. Thank Dim the lights as you leave. Thanks. All right. Perfect. How's that look to everyone? Good. 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 Awesome. Let's get started. So thank you for having me. I think I'll get a big show of hands. Scuba divers and snorkelers, raise your hand. Almost everyone in the crowd, right? <laughs> so I'm super excited to take you on a virtual dive to my study site. Let's get this started. All right. So I'm going to take you on this virtual dive to my study site. So this is a little further north, about two and a half, three hours. This is called Blue Heron Bridge, Phil Foster Park. Anyone in the area have known of Blue Heron Bridge, Phil Foster Park? It's a pretty famous dive site. Hopefully after you see the footage here of these octopuses, you'll be excited to come up north, leave the Florida Keys, although it's beautiful, and dive here. So we went from a daytime dive, seeing one octopus, fast forward to this night dive, where we have another octopus foraging for its food during the nighttime. All right, and believe it or not, there is actually two different species of octopus in that video. And in South Florida, Florida Keys, Caribbean, and also where I'm from up north of West Palm Beach, we have several species of octopus that can be up to 13. However, I'm just gonna show you a few common ones up on this screen right here. And so on the far left, we have, it's called the brown striped octopus right here. And so scientists, we're not gonna try to confuse you. We're gonna say the names exactly of what we think they are for those octopus. So we have the brown striped octopus right here. As you can see, has brown, brown longitudinal stripes all the way down its arms and also across its eye. Next to that animal, this is called the Caribbean reef octopus. I'm sure you've seen it here on night dives in the Florida Keys and also up in um, north of Florida area. And so the key distinguishing feature of this animal is its bluish green iridescent color that it has above its eyes, on its head, on its mantle, and throughout its webbing. And so these two octopuses are medium to large size octopuses. I like to say about the size of like a serving plate or they can be even larger. And I say that because we move to the third octopus. This is a Caribbean two-spot octopus. And it's a much smaller species. It can fit in my hand. So this is a really close up image of this animal. Macro photographer Sandra Edwards took this photo. And so it's hard to show in the picture, but right here I have my arrow 
there's like a blue ring, iridescent ring called a false eye spot that it has below that eye and also below the other eye. And so just to make sure that you guys know, it's the Caribbean 2 spot and not the blue ring octopus, although it has these blue rings on it. For blue ring octopus, those octopus species have about 50 to 60 blue rings, and they're only found in the Indo-Pacific area. You won't find them in our oceans. We're going to jump back to one of the stars. This is the common octopus, and this is the one that you saw in that nighttime footage in that video. And the other star of my research, and also one of my arm octopus. And so this is a relatively small species as well. And so the mantle length, and so that's usually when scientists talk back and forth, and they say, well, how big was that octopus? You can either weigh the animal, or you can say the mantle length was eight inches. And so usually we use that term, mantle length, to talk about how big an octopus was. And so the mantle length of this Atlantic long arm, when I say a relatively small species, its mantle length as an adult is about two to three inches or about the length of my pointer finger. So a pretty small octopus, however, how it gets its name, super long arms. The, long, the arms are about four to seven times its mantle length, as you can see in this picture, that likes to wrap around. It's also relative to the Indo-Pacific mimic octopuses that you may be familiar with if you've watched any nature documentary, Nat Geo, BBC, where you hear about the wonderpus or mimic octopus. Those are very popular mimic octopuses. I'm the cheerleader for the Atlantic long arm because it's also a mimic octopus and it mimics a uh, flatfish or flounder in the area. And then we've got another species, but I'm going to leave this a secret. It's coming soon because I'm going to talk about it in one of uh, one of the, my recent research projects that just wrapped up. And so you saw from the video earlier that there's two species that are actually in relatively high abundance at my study site, Blue Heron Bridge, Phil Foster Park. That's a part of the Lake Worth Lagoon. I mean, over a three year period when I did diving, I marked the den locations of these two different species. All of those green dots are the common octopus and all of those pink dots or purple dots are the Atlantic long arm octopus. So as you can see, I'm a field biologist. I love spending time under the water diving, just like you. So over three years, this was 371 dive hours. And you can see here that these animals are living pretty close to each other, not on the bridge. It's just like that in, on the map, but actually <laughs> under the bridge. Don't worry, the octopus is in the water. And so I like to call them underwater neighbors. So they're living really close to each other. So the big research question is why or how are they living there, underwater neighbors? How are they able to do this and not compete for resources? So they live really close to each other. And the next question was, well, maybe they're living there at different times of the year. So I took all of these dots, all of these octopus dens that I have on that map, and I broke them up into different uh, seasonal categories, winter, spring, summer, and fall to see, well, maybe they're there at different times of the year. So they're not competing or, or running into each other, also known as interference competition. But you can see they have the same trend. So the common octopus in green, Atlantic long arm in pink. Not very many octopus in this intercoastal lagoon during the winter. You start to see a spike, have lots of number of octopus there in the spring, still pretty heavy in the summer, and then it starts to decline in the fall. So I termed the springtime octopus season in the Lake Worth Lagoon. So if you're ever up north and you really want to see the octopus, now is the perfect time to see it um, all the way through summer. I recently got in the water and the octopus, both species are there. Just to give you an idea, on previous dives, when I would dive there during the springtime, you could count up to 10 octopus on one dive, and that could be for one species. So that's a lot of octopus to see on one dive. Usually you're lucky to see one if you're scuba diving, it's usually at nighttime. And a lot of these animals are juveniles. All right, so to answer this big octopus coexistence question, first looked at their distribution. We know that they're underwater neighbors and they're actually living really close to each other and they're there at the same times during the year. 
Next, just to look at, well, maybe they're using different habitat types or different habitat associations. What are they making their dens or their homes out of? Want to also look at activity periods. So maybe they're coming out of their dens to forage and feed at different times of the day. So I like to I like to avoid traffic. So when I was driving down here from Lake Worth, I left early to avoid that interference with other people. Octopuses may be doing a similar thing, coming out at different times of the day to avoid running into each other. And then another mechanism of um, resource partitioning may be they're eating different things. So also looking at their diet. And so this is just a quick clip to show you, oops, let me turn that down before I turn the music up. The in-person folks get a, a nice preview with the music. So sorry, Zoom crew, you don't get any music. But a uh, quick video just to show you of all what we carry when we go on research dives. All right. <clears throat> and so I'd also like to point out, you can probably see on the screen that this video was with Jennifer Adler. She's actually a Nat Geo explorer and advocate for uh, minorities and females in STEM. And so this was actually part of If Then She Can Project. I'm a big advocate and very passionate to um, help and inspire young girls to be in different STEM fields. So I was really excited to be a part of this video. And so what you probably also saw in the video is that we have a lot of equipment that we bring on research dives. And so one of those uh, types of research equi equipment you probably saw was this PVC structure right here that we call a quadrat. And so I used this for the Habitat Association project. So what I did, so you probably saw me with my big camera. When I find an octopus in its den, I overlay the quadrat where that octopus is, and then I photograph what I call its <clears throat> surrounding habitat or den habitat. I do that for the common octopus several times. I do that for the Atlantic long-arm octopus several times to figure out if they are associated with sand, rock, rubble, and structure. Next up, we have looking at their activity periods. And to figure out when an animal is active, you have to know what it's doing 24 hours of the day. You just can't pick when you want to go out and dive. And I don't know about you, but I like my sleep. And I like to be in bed at 3 a.m., not necessarily diving. So what I did is I developed, with the help of an engineer, the octopus monitoring gadget, the 24-hour camera, what we like to call the OMG. And so what this is, it's a GoPro with a very large external battery to make sure that the GoPro is powered for at least 24 hours a red LED light for nighttime footage because octopuses are insensitive to the red wavelength. If we just did a bright white light shining at them, that could alter their behavior. And remember, we want to know their natural foraging or activity times. So we use a red light for that and a very large memory card, just to give you an idea. This was also, we dropped um, the resolution of this video to make sure that we could record full 24 hours so one 24 hour video would be about 89 gigabytes. Yeah, and that was on the lowest resolution. So a lot of large external um, batteries and memory devices I had, but that's okay. And that's okay because we got results. And so this was actually the first uh, footage of the OMG. I was nervous, I was scared that it was gonna flood or it wasn't gonna work. But you can see it was successful. And this is the first octopus uh, that we documented. This is a common octopus leaving its den. And just remember that red light is that red light um, from the OMG. So here, what I'm looking for is natural foraging behavior. So you probably saw the octopus's arms are kind of going out on the sediment. 
We call that speculative bottom searching. Their arms are lined with suckers that can touch and taste the environment. So they know when they have a tasty snack and what they'll do is they'll pull that prey item just like that underneath their arms where their mouth is located. Octopus leaves shortly again after midnight. I'm gonna fast forward this because it's about 90 minutes. I won't make you guys watch this. And so overall, <laughs> makes a grand entrance. So again, this was done for uh, multiple animals for the common octopus and the Atlantic longarm. It was actually over 1,000 hours of video that we watched to figure out um, what time these two species are active. And then we have what's on the menu for these two animals. And so there are multiple ways that you can figure out what octopuses are eating. And so for this Atlantic long arm, I like to say that it eats on the go or the swim. And so what I had to do is follow this animal at a distance to make sure that it did natural foraging behaviors, but also was able to ca capture what this animal was eating. And again, you can see how it, it stretches out its really long arms to touch and taste the environment. <laughs> Scares wow. that crab oh, out of that oh, algae oh. right there. Got him. Got him. Yeah. Yep. And so octopuses have a pretty, pretty uh, fast or high metabolism. So they eat on the go. They may have that one crab, but that's not enough. He's going to go for another one. You can see that. Shame-faced crab right there doesn't get away from that octopus. Another method used was the OMG. So not only did it capture great footage of when the octopuses are coming and going from their dens, but also what they're bringing back to the dens, their different diets. Third, uh, third method that was used for their diets was looking at the prey remains around their dens. And so I was talking to a guest earlier on the how to find an octopus. And you can look for these crevices or areas where the octopus may kind of excavate the sand out and live underneath. And usually they'll leave their prey remains or shells around their den. However, when there's a magic science hand involved, they move those shells away and they place them. So here I am, I move the shells away from this octopus's den so I can photograph them and then ID them later back in the lab. Octopus really wasn't a big fan of this, definitely wanted its shells back. And so usually they'll use their shells to make that opening smaller so a predator cannot come in after them. And so if you're going to check out my gear, I'm going to check out yours. <laughs> and so you can see the you can see the size of these animals compared to my camera. So it's usually relatively small animals or juveniles that I'm seeing at this study site. However, I do see adults here as well. And so three methods were used to get a better idea of the diet of these two species. All right, and some other cool stuff about their feeding behavior and what I like to call their mouth parts, the stranger things. And so we'll get into that, but first how they find their prey, it's definitely a visual and a chemical tactile cue, all of this combined. So first with their vision, they have really cool eyes that are placed on the side of their head. And you notice they, their pupils are also rectangular. And so their eyes being on the side of their head, rectangular pupils allows them to have like a panoramic vision underneath the water. So they're scanning the environment for predators, but also for prey. They also can smell with their skin. They don't have a nose though, look kind of silly, but they actually have dimples in their skin that allows them to smell the chemicals in the water. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned before, their arms play a very important role since they are benthic animals living on the bottom of the seafloor. And so those arms are aligned with suckers. Octopuses have on an average 200 suckers. These suckers are able to touch and taste. There's about 10,000 receptors on each arm. So I'll let you guys do the math of 200 suckers, 10,000 receptors, and then eight arms. That's a lot of information that the octopus is getting from its environment. 
All right, and last but not least, this is actually an upside, a very large upside down crab. So octopus can also handle prey much larger than them because they're really strong. I like to call them a big ball of protein. They can handle large prey and wrap those really strong arms around the prey. Once they've got that prey, they can then use their stranger mouth parts like their beak. It's very similar to a bird beak. However, it's made of chitin and they can crack that prey shell or they can crack the carapace like you have in this crab right here. If that shell is too hard and the beak can't break it or they can't pull it apart with their strength, what they'll do is they'll use this tiny drill in their mouth called the salivary papilla. And so they'll drill a hole into this shell and then they'll inject their saliva that has venom called cephalotoxin. This venom then paralyzes the prey's muscle and then that prey falls, uh, basically relaxes and then the octopus can scoop out the good stuff. And that's an image of its beak right there. And so what I also looked at to see was seeing if drill holes is related to shell thickness. And I actually brought the shells with me that you'll see in the video. So I'm gonna pass those around. You can see if you um, can find the shell, I'll do it two at a time. And if you can, you're hired as a research assistant. <laughs> it's even a challenge because it's darker in here. And so looking at shell thickness and if there's a drill hole. So right there, you can see this drill hole in this clam right here. If you flip that clam over and reverse it, the octopus doesn't have to drill a big hole. It's really tiny, just enough to get the venom in it with its saliva in. And what the octopus does with strategy is it figured out where the site of muscle attachment is. That's where I circled in gray. That's the site of muscle attachment for that clam. It does the same thing for this, for this gastropod, this type of conch. Again, drills a hole right there at the site of muscle attachment. That's because conch have a trap door, an operculum that it can close. So the octopus can't pull it out. And so the octopus will drill a hole, relax the muscle. So then that conch's foot relaxes and it gets that conch out of its shell. It does the same thing or similar thing for crabs. If you can imagine if a crab is caught by an octopus, its arms are probably going crazy, its claws trying to attack it. So what the octopus will do, it will actually drill a hole and inject venom right here in the claw so it paralyzes the crab. <laughs> Sneaky octopus, right? Yeah. All right. And so to wrap up that larger pod, uh, project about octopus coexistence, remember walking through all the methods, they're underwater neighbors living really close to each other. However, they're able to coexist because we found out from the Habitat Association, the common octopus lives in rocky homes or has rocky or structured dens. And the Atlantic long-arm octopus is a sand-dwelling species using, using sand as its den. There's some diet overlap. However, we see the common octopus feeding mostly on bivalves and conch, the two that you see being passed around. And the Atlantic long arm, remember that video, this animal actually like specializes, really likes crabs. Out of all the prey items that I collected, it was only one clam, um, only collected one clam sample from this animal. And also what they do is they feed or they go out and feed or forage at different times of the day to avoid that interference competition. So the common octopus feeds during the nighttime and the Atlantic long arm feeds during the daytime. So using all these different um, behavioral habits allows us to know or understand octopus ecology better in their coexistence, which is very important for biodiversity and because octopuses serve a very important role in many marine food webs. Now the cool stuff. I mean, I thought the other stuff was pretty cool, but we also saw some really cool behaviors and interactions from the ONG. And if you're wondering oh. the different predators of an octopus, oh. well, they've got quite a few. <laughs> Remember that I mentioned the octopus is a big ball of protein. Everything in the ocean and well above wants to eat it. It doesn't have a protective shell. So it definitely has different adaptations that it uses to fend itself out, self off from predators. 
So that was a diving marine bird or a cormorant from up above. Of course, we've got predators in the water column. So one of those adaptations from predators is that quick camouflage that you saw, see right here, changes its color and its texture. This is a primary defense to hide itself. However, if it's detected from a predator, it goes to a second defense called a dematic display right here. Basically, it's gonna poof itself up, look big and scary and say like, back off, I'm big, don't mess with me. A trick that this tiny little Atlantic longarm does, however, that stingray does not bother it. So we've got predators from above, predators in the water column, and then we saw benthic predators like the stingray, and also another benthic predator that actually specializes on octopus, different moray eels. And this is actually a purple mouth moray eel here that actually takes over the octopus's den. I know. So here we go. I know. Pause the video. Sometimes it's hard to see. So here's the here's the eel's head sticking out. I'll leave the cursor right over it. What's gonna happen? Oh, ah. Octo lives another day. All right, and so another idea of coexisting is that the octopuses have a, what I call an octopus or a secret handshake. So they may be able to coexist because they're using all these different types, um, different mechanisms of partitioning the resources. However, but also by being these close underwater neighbors, they may also know who's who by doing their octopus handshake. Remember that their arms are aligned with all of those suckers that have chemotactile cues. So scientists think that octopus can reach out, do their handshake, and figure out who's who, if they're the same species or not, or if they're the same or if they're the opposite sex. And so in the back, we have the common octopus. In the front of the video, we have the Atlantic long arm standing tall, what I like to call the tripod stance. They extend their arms, and as soon as they do, they're out. They don't want anything to do with each other. And so this was actually filmed at Blue Heron Bridgeville Foster Park. So they are very close to each other. And so doing those handshakes, figuring out who's who is definitely important for communication and allowing them to coexist. Okay, so that was several years figuring out the two species that coexist in this uh, Lake Worth Lagoon learning a lot about their biology and their ecology. And although that project ended, it opened up their door for a lot of different research questions, since I know where the octopuses are, who's there, what they feed on, and also what times of the day that they come out. It makes it a lot easier to sample um, and to figure out how to do work with octopuses, right? And so the next, the next three projects are going on or they're wrapping or currently wrapping up. And so right now I'm working on projects that involve the octopus skin microbiome, octopus arm flexibility, and also different projects on octopus genetics. And so right now we know that bacteria play a key role in cephalopod lifestyles. And so a few examples that I wanted to show right here um, are we have the bobtailed squid. And so this bobtailed squid is actually producing light, but the squid isn't doing that itself. It's actually a symbiotic bacteria that lives in the squid's light organ located in its mantle. So that symbiotic bacteria playing a very important role for this squid's type of camouflage known as counterillumination that hides the silhouette from predators um, so the squid can live another day. Another example of how bacteria important is with the blue ringed octopus. And I think everyone's familiar with this guy and knows that this octopus has a very potent neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin. So I mentioned that octopuses are venomous. So all octopuses have that cephalotoxin. However, this blue ring octopus and another species have this TTX or tetrodotoxin in their saliva. 
and the octopus does not produce that. It's actually a bacteria that produces this toxin for this octopus. And you can also see or find this um, bacteria associated with other animals such as newts and pufferfish as well. And so this is very important for the animals, how it hunts and also how it defends itself against predators. Another example is when we look at cuttlefish and octopus eggs. They are known to coat their eggs in beneficial bacteria to help combat any infection or biofouling bacteria or fungus to keep those eggs healthy. And so, so far, I've talked about all the good beneficial bacteria. However, there's the bad and it can get ugly for octopuses. So pathogenic bacteria can cause skin lesions, deep wounds, or can even be fatal to um, octopuses in the wild or in the lab. And so to limit the increased exposure to this infection, the first line of defense are external barriers such as the skin. And so usually, there we go, usually when we think of the octopus's skin, we think of their color changing abilities, right? These octopuses are loaded with color changing cells known as chromatophores. These chromatophores have different types of pigment in the center of them, and these pigments can be brown, orange, red, or yellow. And so when, they, when these cells that have pigments in them are expanded, it expands that color. And so that octopus can look brown, red, or orange. And you can imagine millions of chromatophores, the octopus can either, the octopus can create different pattern types. However, it doesn't stop there because we know octopuses can achieve like a rainbow of colors. So under those pigmented cells, we have the reflective and refractive cells known as aridophores and leucophores that give us those blues, uh, whites, yellows, and greens that allow this octopus to achieve this color or color patterns in less than one second. So again, this colorful or magic skin is very important for camouflage, it's important for communication, and also prey attraction. However, their skin is also important for lubrication and protection. They have different types of mucus on their skin, and it's thought that this mucus interacts with different types of bacteria on their skin. Which brings us to the research question of, well, does the octopus have a unique skin microbiome? And so for the microbiome, I'm going to focus on the different types of bacteria or the bacteria community that we find on the octopus's skin. And so I'm not a microbiologist. Um, however, I was contacted by researchers at Nova Southeastern University and said, hey, you know how to find an octopus and you know their behavior. Do you think you could swab an octopus for its bacteria? And I was like, hmm. I was like, well, we can sure try. And so that's exactly what I did for this project. I didn't want to remove the octopuses for a long period of time out of the water. So I developed the floating lab. And so this is a fancy $5 boogie board and some um, takeout containers of soup. So basically what I modified is I modified this boogie board to be my dive flag. I cut out the center of it. I cut out a square where you can see my little octopus basket. And then the takeout containers I modified to put my swabs in and also my containers for sediment and water. And so the idea is I swab the octopus for the bacteria that's on its skin. And then I also take water samples and sediment samples of the same area where I collected the octopus so I can compare those different samples to see what bacteria are in those three different groups. And so I've got, so basically what I did here is I have my, one of my swabs that I've brought with me is a foam tip tip swab. And so this has to stay sterile. Remember, I only want the bacteria that's on the octopus. So I have this little transport tube that I take in my little takeout container with me. And then once I'm ready, I take it out of the octopus, swab it, and then, and then put it back in. And so I can talk about it all day, but it's much better if you see it in action. So that's the area of the octopus again, where I'm swabbing the mantle. Here we go. <clears throat> Yeah. 
What just happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. And another thing um, that I didn't previously me men mention, but you notice that I'm collecting the octopus ascending to my dive float and then back down. So as divers, you know, it's not a smart thing to do that if it's super deep, right? So I'm able to do this because my study sites are pretty shallow. The average depth is 10 to 15 feet. And sometimes I find octopuses in shallow areas. So I'm able to collect this octopus. I send up to my dive float, inflate my BC. I work at my floating lab, and then I go back down. All right. So I'm going to make this as painless as possible and take you back to biology 101, where you learn taxonomy and the kingdom, biome, class, order, family, genus, species. Don't worry, we won't spend too much time on it. So this is just to give you an idea and to give you an example of kind of how animals are grouped and classified together, not just animals, all organisms in general. And so what we have here is that, you know, we start with octopuses, an animal that we're familiar with. They belong to a larger phylum known as mollusca. They have a mantle. They have, we kind of talked about their mouth parts being, they have a radula, beaks, all that. So animals that have similar characteristics are grouped together. Very broad general phylum mollusca. We move on to our class cephalopoda. The cephalopods, we've got octopus, cuttlefish, squid, and nautilus are more alike than our other mollusks, such as our clams, gastropods, and so on. So we group those animals together. The ones that have eight feet or eight limbs are a part of our octopus group. And from there, we get into more specific characteristics that group animals that are more alike together, all the way down to genus and species. And so for the genus, we have octopus, which is a very large genus, and then the species vulgaris. So that's octopus vulgaris right here. And so if I talk about my other animal, I have all the way down, we see that the two species belong to all these same taxonomic levels, except they're different enough in their genus that they're actually in two different genera. So this one on the right side, the Atlantic long arm is actually called Macrotritopus de Philippi. Well, good with a taxonomy. <laughs> yeah, so don't worry. I'm not going to do all of that for bacteria because that's a lot. Maybe. And so, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> all right. And so I just wanted to give you a quick, uh, quick idea of how broad that taxonomic group can be, all the way down to the genus and species level. And we're talking about a single species. And so for bacteria, we have uh, the large phylum of bacteria ID. Sorry, this is blocking up the phone. I'm trying to get that out. Mm, that's okay. All right, and so for the, we have here, I'm showing different phylums. So really large groups of bacteria. So I want to, I want you to pay attention to the one in orange. And so we see that the microbiomes, the skin microbiomes of octopus differ from those sediment and those seawater samples that I collected. And so we had a lot of bacteria from the phylum Bacteroides on the octopus. However, it was low representation for the sediment and seawater. So more Bacteroides bacteria are found on the octopus skin. And so we already know from that big phylum level, the octopus skin microbiome is different. And so we're gonna jump all the way to genus and species. And I'm gonna tell you why here in just a second. So do you remember our friend, the bobtail squid? If not, here it is. And it had that special symbiotic bacteria that produced bioluminescence in its light organ. So this is the breakdown of that bacteria belonging to this huge phylum and so the name of this bacteria that live in the squid's light organ is Vibrio fischeri. And so this is a very beneficial bacteria for this animal. And so what I wanna point out, don't worry, there won't be a quiz. There will be just a simple take home message from all of these crazy named bacteria you see on the screen. So what I wanted to show you is that we started at the big phylum level bacteriaides. And we worked all the way down to genus and species of what you see here in this Venn diagram. 
both species have a lot of bacteria that are present on their skin. But what's really cool is that they're species specific bacteria, meaning on the common octopus, you're only finding this genus and species of bacteria. Whereas on the Atlantic long arm octopus, there's six unique genus and species of bacteria over here. And so what we have here, remember our Vibrio fisheri friend from the bobtail squid, that was a good bacteria. Why I went to genus and species is because I wanted to show you that even at the genus level, bacteria can be very different. And so here we have Vibrio harvii. And so this is act, actually a pathogenic bacteria. And so it, what I wanted to do with this study is I wanted to see what exactly the bacteria were, genus and species, to figure out if they were beneficial or if they were possibly pathogenic bacteria. And so the take home message here is that we have both non-pathogenic and pathogenic bacteria on the octopuses. But what's really cool is that there are species specific bacteria on the octopus skin. And so we see that they are already kind of covered this, but the significance of the skin care is that it's really cool. This was the first study done on two wild species of octopus to figure out that yes, they do have unique skin microbiome. And what I just mentioned before is that these symbiotic bacteria on their skin consist of non-pathogenic and pathogenic bacteria. From these non-pathogenic bacteria, Several groups on that Venn diagram that you saw earlier are known to be biodegraders, produce pigments, or squalene. Some of these pigments are known as carotenoids and also the squalene. They're known to be natural antioxidants, also antifungal and antibacterial. So these bacteria that are living on the octopus's skin could serve an important role against environmental stressors and also inhibit fungal or bacteria growth from those pathogens that we saw. All right, so that's wrapping up the octopus skin microbiome project and switching gears to talk about octopus arm flexibility. So over the years, I've collected a lot of octopus videos specifically looking at their behaviors. So we had there that that octopus was mimicking, remember mimicking the flatfish? We also have a moving rock trick, and they can also masquerade like moving seaweed. And so these are very complex behaviors that the octopus achieves through its color, its skin color patterns, and also by moving and contorting its eight arms in different ways. So we wanted to break down these complex behaviors for bioinspiration or biomimicry for soft robotics. So how the octopus can do this is remember it's a big ball of protein with no bones. And so we like to say that they are squishy and they're made up of muscular hydrostats just like our tongue. And so they have a central brain but they also have nerve cords down each arm. Octopuses have about 500 million neurons. Two thirds of those neurons are throughout their arms and their skin. And so their arms serve as a very important um, feature to them as you saw previously in those videos. And so having that muscular hydrostat and smart arms allows them to achieve these complex behaviors that we looked at for foraging behaviors and possibly as defense mechanisms. However, we're now taking these foraging behaviors that you see here and we're breaking them down for a different purpose. And so when we score or analyze this octopus video, we have to score or analyze every single arm. Mm -hmm. And so as you can imagine, you're watching this video eight different times and you need to make sure when you're talking to the other scientists that's working on this project with you that you're talking about the same arm or <laughs> things to get bad. And so what we do is that in the science, in the octopus science world is that we have arm pairs. And so we have left and right arm pair one, two, three, and four. So we go through and we pick an arm and we score it and we can talk about it. And so remember, we're taking those complex behaviors. This is just an example right here, the behavior of walk. So you can see, and we're looking at that 
that arm that's highlighted in, in blue. We're only picking out one arm action. And so we have different arm actions. This one, not to be confusing, it's reaching. So we call it reach. And so this arm is reaching. And you can see this specific area of that reach in that arm is called a bend, a deformation. So what we do is we break down behaviors into arm actions and then deformations. We've got four deformations that we talked about. We do bend, elongation, shorten, and torsion or twist. And so those are the deformations that are also used in engineering. And so our job is to analyze and score this behavior and then pass it off to engineers and others to say, these are the deformations and the actions use it for bio-inspiration for soft robotics. And so we're wrapping up this project right now, but as you can see here, the octopus is and the ultimate multitasker. I need to learn from the octopus how to multitask. And so you can see in, in the image on the left, A, that it, in a single arm, it can perform multiple actions at once. You can see in the beginning of the arm, which we call the proximal part, that it raises, medial area reaches, and then it curls. However, they've got eight arms, right? So they're gonna use them. So remember that complex um, moving rock behavior. This is a snapshot of that. And you can see multiple arms can perform different actions simultaneously to achieve these complex behaviors. So just think of a soft robot moving along that you want to do multiple things. You can model it after an octopus. All right. I know you've been waiting for what this box is, right? The entire time. So we're moving on to the last bit of octopus genetics. And so one of the stars of the show, remember the octopus vulgaris, this is the common octopus. And once upon a time, this octopus was thought to be cosmopolitan, meaning that it lived worldwide. So basically it lived worldwide these different colors just represented the different types of octopus vulgaris, and that was dependent on their geographical location. So you've got the original or OG octopus vulgaris living here, and then they found octopus vulgaris living in North and South America, around Africa, and so on. So they said in these different areas, okay, well, they all look alike. This is octopus vulgaris type one, type two, type three. Sounds all right as long as you talk with each other and, and then specify the geographical location. However, there's advancements in molecular tools and genetics, and we see that that wasn't necessarily the case. So remember, all those different colors used to be what we saw octopus vulgaris through molecular tools. It goes from cosmopolitan to complex. So this is known as the octopus vulgaris species complex. And so some of these animals that once were thought to be octopus vulgaris are a completely different species. And we're gonna focus on these two, maybe three that I've circled right here in blues and greens, octopus insularis, which is the Brazilian reef octopus, and our friend octopus vulgaris, which may be someone else. All right. And so this is pretty much what I feel like right now. Well, we are definitely solving the mysteries of the octopus species in South Florida and also throughout the Caribbean and other areas. And so this was definitely um, a collaboration project and also a citizen science project. And so I got a call from a scientist in Brazil to start working on a body pattern project for octopuses. And we really wanted to focus on body patterns for the octopus vulgaris. But she asked me if I had seen octopus insularis, the Brazilian reef octopus in my area in Florida. And I said, no, I'm not familiar with that species. Could you send me some pictures? And she said, yes, the distinguishing feature is this red and white reticulated pattern. And I said, okay, I haven't seen that. I don't see any of my animals that I've been studying at Blue Heron to have that, but I'll keep a, I'll keep a lookout. So we did a call to underwater photographers to send us their images of octopus vulgaris so we could do our body pattern project. And as I was going through all of the photos from Florida underwater photographers, I noticed that, well, 
these arms are not uniform. They are a red and white reticulated pattern. And then I asked the photographers, where did you take this, West Palm Beach? This one was actually text, uh, text sent, sent to me from a good friend that does manta ray research that lives nearby off of the Lantana Beach. And I get her text message and she says, hey, we just saw this octopus. What species is it? And I said, this is not the common octopus. Please take me to this octopus. So if you're ever wondering what marine biologists do on the weekend, that's it. <laughs> and so we did a beach dive and um, went out to this octopus. And as we were on our way out to this specific octopus, I said, well, I'm going to take a look under the ledges to see if I can find any more octopuses along the way. And on our way out to this octopus, I spotted three more octopus in Solaris. So I said, welcome to Florida. This is not just the Brazilian reef octopus. And so we did a paper that went through the different um, visual IDs of the species, how to identify it versus the common octopus. And then we were also able to do genetics and figure out that this was indeed octopus in Solaris in Florida. And so we're thinking that possibly that this was thought to be a tropical species only being in Brazil. However, with war warmer water temperatures, it could actually be expanding its range north. And so it's still early, but we know now that this octopus is here. This creates a baseline and we can figure out and study further what is happening with octopus in Solaris. Next up for octopus genetics is this octopus vulgaris uh, mystery. So there may possibly be uh, reinstating the name octopus americanus. And so what we thought was octopus vulgaris in Florida may actually be a different species. And so we have a master's student, Colleen Hecker, that's working on this and she's wrapping up the project soon. And so by fall, we will know if this is octopus vulgaris or americanus, so stay tuned. <laughs> All right, so to wrap up everything, I like to call the octopus our scientific advisor because it can tell us a lot of information about our oceans and also ocean inspiration. So it's very important for ecology, its microbiome, it lets us know about ocean health, but also have some information about bioproducts to use. Arm flexibility, definitely it's good for bioinspiration for soft robotics. The genetics, the genetics are really important for biodiversity, fisheries, knowing what octopus species is who, and also that genetics can be used for different areas of science like neuroscience. Also science communication is a big part of what I do as well. I do research at Florida Atlantic University. However, I also lead a science outreach program called the Marine Sea Scholars. C stands for science, education, and art. This allows graduate and undergraduate students to learn about the research that's done at the FAU Marine Lab and talk about it to the general public. So this has to do with collaboration and a broader impact. And so also to do with collaboration, we've got a new student in, in the, I guess, in the area. So this is Shane Springbat. He is a new PhD student that will be joining FAQ. And I say collabor collaboration because he also works for FWC research team. He's on the lobster team here in the Keys off Marathon. So he'll be joining the Octo Posse, I like to call it, at the FAU Marine Lab. And his project will be exploring, exploring how the Florida octopuses, how they interact with the Caribbean spiny lobster which is very important. I don't know if we have any uh, lobster or crab fishermen out there. Nope, I don't see anyone. So, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah? oh <laughs> now I'm seeing, now I'm seeing, oh, now I'm seeing Sam. So it's very important for us to know how these species are interacting because octopuses are very important marine food, but, but also it's very important for seafood lovers. So we're basically very beginning um, to the study. So Shane will be starting in the fall. So he's done some exploratory looking at camera traps and seeing what's happening underwater between the octopus and the lobster. So we're going to figure that out and also hopefully do a citizen science project talking to different um, Keys residents and also fishermen 
So if you see Shane, Shane, raise your hand. He is a friendly face and we're trying to figure out uh, what's going on between the spiny lobster and the octopus and hopefully um, possibly uh, figure out how to do a deterrent so the octopuses don't get in the lobster traps and eat the lobsters. <laughs> yeah, so pretty good, right? All right. So I wanted again to thank you very much. Um, you can follow me on all these different social media sites. So I wear many hats. Again, I have my own um, social media site, the Octo Girl. So I've done a lot of underwater diving. And so the community knows me as Octo Girl because I'm always asking where the octopus are at. Also, the FAU Marine Lab, you can keep up with our research. And again, I mentioned how I'm very passionate about science communication and outreach. So I'm part of the Octopus uh, nonprofit for education called Octo Nation. And so you can follow me at any of those or at all of those places. Thank you very much. And I'll take any questions if we have time. So when you, you get a question from the audience, if you could repeat it for those watching on Zoom and I'll collect oh any questions from Zoom and bring them into you. Sounds good. Thank you. I saw your hand go up first. Yeah. Um, with all this collecting all this octo slime stuff, is any of it dangerous to you? So collecting the octopus slime or the mucus from the from the microbiome? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is any of the mucus and bacteria that I'm collecting from the octopus skin, is it harmful to me? And I do not believe it is. Um, however, I'm not physically touching the animal. And so I'm wearing gloves, but I'm also collecting the animal in the basket because I do not want to disrupt its microbiome or interfere with it in any way. So I'm actually not touching it in any way. And if you see one, so you shouldn't try and touch it. No. So usually I, I like to respect uh, the marine life. So usually I do a lot of natural observations unless I am collecting an animal for research purposes. Just to let everyone know, when we do research, um, we have to go through extensive um, training. And also I have a special activity license from FWC, and also we have an animal care committee. And so we have a protocol that goes through them that has to be approved. So they just don't let us do whatever we want. <laughs> we go through a lot of training. Yes. You studied a lot of behavior based yeah. on time of year. The, the area you're researching has fairly severe tidal changes. Mm -hmm. Do you see any change in the animal behavior with the tidal change? Yeah, great question. Do I see any change in animal behavior with the tidal changes? And so what I looked at is I, I looked at that with their activity periods to see depending on the tidal changes or full moon and new moons, um, if there was any change in their activity period. And I didn't see anything with just looking at their foraging behaviors. However, with other behaviors such as mating with full moons, and that could be different as well. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. I have a child. Uh, oh, sorry. Nope. Yeah, that's you. I'm just trying to work my way back. I have two questions. Um, the first one is about the hunting the prey and when it is able to locate the muscle attachment point. Um, it, is that constant or is it random? And if it like targets that muscle point, how does it know? And is it coming from brain or from the arm sensors? Do you yes. know yet? Yeah. So when it injects, um, when it injects the venom into the animal, like first when it drills the hole, how does it know where to drill the hole? Yes, so it's definitely it's learned. Um, looking at photos and also the prey items that I collected, it's not always like directly, you know, it's, it's a learned behavior to okay. where it's like, it may be in different areas um, of the octopus. So it's not in the same spot every single time. Okay. And you don't know yet if it's coming from that so brain I would, with the arm. Central, sensors. yeah. Central brain is responsible for learning and memory. Okay. So it's probably most like oh, learning. Yes. And then my second question was, have you ever um, corroborated with the octopus specialist, David Scheel from Alaska? He's the guy that recently discovered a new octopus species up there and yeah. an incredible book out called Many Things Under a Rock yep. and a new documentary, relatively new, called uh, Making Contact. Have you, do you work with these? I'm seeing a lot or hearing a lot. Of yeah, so, so David and I have not 
worked on a project together, collaborated. However, we do know each other and we've been to conferences together and we've actually communicated back and forth because I read one of David's previous papers. So he did the swabs um, yeah, for octopus just, genetics. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, David's yeah. paper used the swabs um, for octopus genetics <laughs> because first I was using things you thought you would never like think you'd focus on. <laughs> polyester versus foam tip swabs. <laughs> so first I was using polyester swabs and it wasn't collecting enough mucus and bacteria. So I found David's paper and then it showed that for a low amounts of um, skin cells, use foam tip swabs. So I switched and we contacted back and forth about genetics. Long story short, we haven't collaborated. We know each other. We're at conferences together and we geek out and we show each other <laughs> octopus videos. What we're doing. Can you, could you stop sharing your screen so you're full oh, screen yes and that way people can see you a little better there we go oh, uh, <laughs> just keep, will this work or no uh do you want me to pin myself go ahead and take more questions more questions um when you're looking at forging behavior under the blue hair bridge here's about den spacing what was the shortest distance between two dens and with that was there any instances of intraspecific competition that you witnessed yeah so how close dens were so they were i would say the closest dens for the same species like there are structures or pipes there that could maybe be like this long and there would be two octopus like one at this end and one at this end so they're really really close to each other um that's for the same species for different species uh, probably, uh, um, I would say maybe a meter or so, it's like three feet or a little bit more, still relatively close. And it's also, I didn't really show like the heterogeneous environment of blue heron, but really, you know, what's important about blue heron and how they can coexist is like, remember, the common octopus uses that rock and rubble, the Atlantic water uses that sand. So if those patches are really close to each other, the two animals might be close to each other, but usually uh, the two different species, I'd say maybe, um, I think it was around a meter or that far away and inter or intra species. So yes, I did see, I did see fighting. Mm -hmm. So there was fighting um, among the species and remember that octopus handshake, usually the two different species would split. I would definitely see, um, interactions or fighting within species and also uh then take over for one would take over then kick out the other one yeah i did have one question on zoom from yeah. john and eva they wanted to know how do you tell the difference between different octopuses if you return um to the water like if you go to a different site how do you know it's not the same octopus from another site if they move around yeah that's a great question so how do i know if it's a if it's not the same octopus from a different site or not. And so for a lot of my work, I stay at the same study site. However, I guess I don't know if they're coming or going. And so for the previous study, when I was looking at the octopuses over a three year period, when looking at um, their den, their spatial distributions of their dens, octopuses have relatively short lifespans. The two species that I study are about a year. So I know that the next year that I come back, those are different species. And for that study, I purposely just wanted to know the den location so I could get an understanding of their spatial distribution. And then I use that information as like a proxy of the number, or how abundant. And so if an animal was at the same location that I already sampled, I did not resample that animal or that location just in case um, that was the same animal. Can't really know if it was same or different um, unless you are tagging them or if they have a scar or a marking to identify them. So do you get to, uh, can you identify different uh, octopus when you die? So do you get to recognize? Do I get to recognize different octopuses when I die? And so you... <laughs> Yes and no. Usually I'm not going back and studying the same species over a period of time. I'm trying to sample different animals, but octopuses, depending on the species. So for the common octopus, they'll usually return to their same den or their same site and stay there for either a couple of days 
weeks or months, depending on the real estate or how, how the den is in that area. And so I did go back for one specific individual octopus and documented it over a month and a half. And so I did follow that individual for that amount of time. But usually I'm not following the same individual. Can you recognize Can them? I recognize them? From, from another individual? Um, Aside from location. No, unless unless they have some scar or some marking or a tag. Yeah, but there are, I mean, unless I spend some a lot of time, I haven't really spent that much time with individuals, but... They have shown that in different species of octopus, like um, the wonder puss or the mimic uh, mimic octopus, that they have specific um, skin patterns, kind of like a whale shark or you know how we have a unique fingerprint. So they have specific patterns. So if you were to study that pattern, you could identify individuals. I don't know if I would try to do that with in the field, but usually take a snapshot and then load it up into a software system. So it's it's possible. Um, I, we've read a lot about uh, Vibrio vulnificus as yes. a toxic neurotoxin producing bacteria. And I see the Vibrio and the other uh, bacteria that were, were toxic. Is, have you, has anyone looked at any correlation between that and, say, a bloom of octopi and maybe a fish kill, like what's happening to the small tooth sawfish? Yeah, so with the, the sawfish, um, I believe that is, it's the, the spinning fish disease is what they're calling it right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so I don't, um, I don't know if it's necessarily due to a bacteria. I think scientists are still figuring out what that's, what the factors are with water quality. I don't think they think it's anything with depleted oxygen. Um, so as far as I know, I don't know if that's associated with bacteria or a bloom like Vibrio vulnificus. Also with these different species of Vibrio, Vibrio vulnificus is more of a bracket, brackish to freshwater bacteria that you'll find in lagoons. It doesn't really last in, in the ocean. And so, but that is a concern um, with warmer water temperatures is you get more pathogenic bacteria. So that definitely is a concern to think that like, all right, what is the skin bacteria on the octopus? Hopefully protecting it possibly when more pathogenic bacteria arise with warmer water temperatures. I had a question about the drilling of the hole. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a long process other mechanical because mechanical means and the chemical means of enzyme that help close that hole? Yeah, and so it's definitely, um, it does take some time. Um, I think I've read in the, in the literature, it could be like 20 minutes to an hour or more, depending on. So usually when they're drilling that hole, they'll probably take that prey item back to their den where they're safe and then drill it. And so it's definitely mechanical, but also within the saliva, I didn't mention that neurotoxin. However, the saliva also does have enzymes to start breaking down um, the shell and also and also the prey item to start digesting it. Another fun fact about the octopus is that it has a donut brain. <laughs> and so everyone, like I'm gonna, everyone can come up and see this afterwards if you want, but that's a good demonstration. So we also worked with the uh, Guinness Book of World Records Ocean was here. So it was fun, I got to work with the illustrators <laughs> and artists there. And so I got to make sure that the giant Pacific octopus that they illustrated was anatomically correct and the facts were correct. And so this does have a donut brain. And so what I mean by that is that the octopus's esophagus actually runs through the center of its brain. So literally the whole, the brain right here and then the esophagus going straight through. So the octopus can't have any large food pieces or it could hurt its brain. So, it, <laughs> right? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and so what it does is that it will start digesting the food before and shredding it up with its radula. It's like a ribbon tooth like tongue um, and start chewing its food really, really fine and then swallow it so it doesn't hurt its brain. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool.
I know, right? There are aliens. Wait, when you dive blue heron, you dive at slack tide only, or do you go out there and fight it all day long? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, about about the blue heron bridge uh, dive site. Since it is, and I've got kind of some beautiful stuff here, and so you can come take a look. This was in the presentation. So yeah, the Blue Heron Bridge is really close to the Palm Beach Inlet. So it's heavily influenced by the tidal cycle. And so best time to dive is high slack tide. So that's when all the clear seawater, ocean water is coming in. And by high slack tide, that can be 30 to 60 minutes before high tide and after high tide. So you could get about an hour or two or longer if you're leaning, just stay in there. <laughs> you're staring at an octopus. So you can get a lot of bottom time, which is also great for animal behavior work, getting a lot of time observing them. So that's the best time to go. But sometimes after that switches, you do get that before, you get that incoming current, after you get the outcoming current, and it gets, it's a lot to fight. And there have been times where I've stayed in the water a little too long and like you're fighting it to get back. But yeah, I try to go at a uh, high tide. And of course that's getting later about 45 minutes to an hour like every day. So if you ever want to dive Blue Heron Ridge, the tide chart that I use is Noah's Port of Palm Beach tides. And that's what I use for Blue Heron. Yeah. How many cameras have you lost? <laughs> Actually, like, well, zero. I, but I've lost one camera to a human. Oh. <laughs> they stole my OMG. Oh. I know. It was even the sign on it. So I've lost zero cameras uh, to an octopus. Uh, luckily, I'm usually holding on to it. However, there's been some times I've got a pretty... I've got a pretty big camera, and it's a pretty small octopus. It's not a giant Pacific octopus like the stories we may hear yeah, about when they take grab it. them. So yeah. luckily, they just usually crawl around it, and then I just pick it up, and then they go on their way. So, so far, zero. <laughs> when they drill through the shells, how long does that take? Yeah, so I was talking about this a little bit earlier, like 20 minutes to an hour. I think it definitely, it's going to vary depending on the thickness of the, of the shell as well. So it's it's not that quick. Hey, okay, two more questions from Zoom. Oh, yeah. One is, um, do the octopus tend to stay in their one den or do they move around? Excellent question. And so usually... Uh, for octopus species, they will stay in the same den for a certain period of time, days, weeks, or even months. However, the Atlantic longarm octopus doesn't really do that. It likes to hop around since it's a sand dwelling species. What it will do is it will use its long arms and actually create a burrow or its dam, a den, and it kind of like squishes itself down into that tunnel. It can actually tunnel and burrow. And so that's another project that an incoming master's student is going to help me out with because we really don't know the biomechanics of the burrowing of the Atlantic long arm. We know it does it, we know it goes down and then pops up, but that's about it. And so we're excited to study that. And so to get back to the question, usually they'll hang out, but for certain species like the Atlantic long arm, they will leave and they'll create their own dens and they'll steal dens. And so that was also challenging with the OMG. Remember, I need 24 hours. I need this octopus to be in the den, leave, come back, and do its thing. However, that's how we discovered that the Atlantic long arm doesn't necessarily stay in the same location. They keep leaving. And so I had to deploy the OMG several more times to make sure that I got enough footage of that animal. Okay. Um, this last question is actually mine. Um, so you mentioned that the irregular octopus, like the ones you study, have cephalotoxin and that yes. all octopuses have that toxin. So my question is, we all know the blue ring octopus is dangerous to humans. Is a regular octopus with that cephalotoxin at all dangerous to humans? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question, if that cephalotoxin is dangerous to humans. And First, well, I think we talked about this earlier, like don't handle an octopus unless you have, you know, the permits or the training to do so, um, admire them in, in their natural habitat. 
However, um, I know that sometimes you don't know an octopus is in a shell or a can and you pick it up and there it is. So it happens and some people do get bit by an octopus and they can it can hurt a little sting or they can develop a little rash. However, this is gonna this is gonna vary depending on individuals. And I like to give the example of moon jellyfish. Has anyone been stung by a moon jellyfish here? Yeah. Susan yeah. Mayo's going up. Yeah, or the upside down jellyfish Cassiopeia. Do you break out in a big rash? <laughs> no, some, pe some people do. And so I like to give the example of me and my other research assistant. And so we were diving in, there was a moon jellyfish and I would get stung by moon jellyfish and it's just like, oh, that's a little sting and like it goes away. If she gets stung by a moon jellyfish, her face just blows up and like it was after a dive and I didn't know. And then I looked at her and her lip was like twice the size and I was just like, oh my God, are you okay? Like, do you need anything? And so I like to use that example because with octopus as well, there can be different reactions. It's kind of like bees and some people are allergic, some aren't. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's all. Yeah. But um, I do want to say thank you so much, Chelsea, for coming in today. And I do want to thank our Immerse Yourself sponsors for tonight as well, the Mizzo family. Um, I want to thank everyone in the room and over Zoom for coming. And yeah, thank you guys for having <laughs> questions as a gift to you and a thank you for being our presenter we are giving you a year-long uh, membership <laughs> thank you thank you guys